QuickBooks Desktop 2024 Customer Prepayment Overview The Problem. Get ready and some coffee because we're locking into some non stop QuickBooks Desktop 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are on our desktop, gonna be opening up QuickBooks Desktop, the enterprise version as opposed to the Pro Plus version so we can look at the prepayment feature, noting that in a prior presentation, we set up the sample company file. I housed it here in this folder. So this is the actual data file. I'm gonna open it by simply double clicking on the, uh, the actual software file rather than the data file, which is the typical technique, the typical maneuver, the typical process. And then we'll open up the data file within the software. Now, oftentimes it might open up to the prior data file that you were using. In this case, it's gonna give us that intro screen for the trial version. Here we have it. I'm going to scroll down to, I want to open an existing company file because we already set up the sample company file before. I'm going to the, where I located the folder, double clicking on that sample company file, and it should then open it up. It usually opens up the home page when we open this up. I will usually adjust this, go into the view tab. If your view is a little bit different, I usually hide the icon bar completely. And then I go to the view tab and I look at the open windows list. So I have my open windows on the left hand side. I can close this screen so I don't need that screen anymore. Therefore, I only have the home tab open. Now I will often then open up my major financial statement reports no matter what I am doing. So that'll be if I go to the reports drop down in company and financial, I'm going to be looking at uh, let's open the balance sheet first the balance sheet. And then it's showing as of 12, 15, 26. I'm going to bring it out to 12, 31, 27 because I'm going to start to enter the data uh, in the following year. And then I'm going to go to the reports drop down, company file, and the profit and loss. It's going from 2026. I'm going to go from tab 010127, tab 123127 for the year of 2027. So there is nothing in it. Uh, at this point in time when we start our practice problem. Now, first, let's just go to the home page and think about the issue that we have and how we can basically deal with that issue. And then we'll talk about it in a step-by-step -step process because oftentimes the prepayment process is quite confusing. It can take a few different forms and there are different ways that we can basically accommodate or deal with it, each of them possibly being appropriate uh, depending on our accounting structure. So we're down here. Let's look at the customer cycle. Now note that if you're not in the enterprise version and uh, you're in the pro version, for example, you might not see this icon for the sales order. So that first might throw some people off and they see that. If you don't have your estimates on for a job cost so that you have estimates turned on, which I believe are on by default, you won't see the estimates. But I think by default, you usually have the estimates here and then uh, if you're in the enterprise, you've got the, uh, the sales order. Uh, so let's first just look at the, no think about the normal process, which is beautifully laid out here in the homepage with the flow chart. So, so let's imagine that we're in a situation where we take an estimate, which might not always be the case. We might, uh, we might be in a situation where we just have sales and we don't take an estimate, but let's take the longest version of the cycle. We have an estimate. Now the estimate might be, we can imagine someone calling in and basically saying, 
uh, that they might want to make a purchase. Obviously, estimates will be there in a job cost type of system where we have a longer project that th we're putting together. But that's when we're going to basically lay out how much we think it's going to cost, what we're going to be charging and whatnot within the estimate, the estimate looking like an invoice, but it doesn't actually post anything. Nothing will actually be posted with the estimate. It's an internal document. Now, then if uh, the client accepts the estimate, then if you didn't have the sales order, you would basically say, well, then I'm going to go to the invoice over here and I'm going to create uh, the invoice from it. So that's how you would have it if you didn't have a sales order. But if you have the sales order, you can get this added step where you're saying, okay, the estimate might not be accepted. I might have a bunch of estimates depending on the type of industry or company that I'm in that I have created. And I might only actually fulfill or have some estimates that are accepted that could be a low percentage of the ones that I make, right? So the sales order is a nice in-between step that, that can kind of give you an indication that the estimate has now been accepted. Now, if you're in a job cost kind of system or something like that, the work still has not yet been done. You've just kind of like finalized the fact that now you're gonna begin the job. Or if you're purchasing inventory, for example, it might be the situation where they want the inventory, some custom prod, some custom surfboard or guitar or whatever, and now you're gonna have to order, order that uh, for them and possibly select a deposit at that point in time. But let's get to the deposits later. So now you have the sales order, still an internal type of document, uh, not actually recording anything on the financial statements, but one that we wanna track internally so that we can take action on it. Now, then you can see from here, the arrow goes from here, if I'm looking at the revenue cycle to the invoice. So the next thing that would happen is we might take that sales order and say, now we're gonna create an invoice. Now, when does the invoice usually happen? If you're in a normal kind of system, let's say you're selling inventory or something like that, or doing some jobs that are not too long in duration, you're doing a cleaning service or, or something like that, uh, then you're gonna do the work or you'll provide uh, the product and you will then charge them at that point in time, the work having been completed, therefore under a revenue recognition principle, you record the revenue at the point in time that you completed it, which would be the point in time that you send the invoice. So the invoice is the one that actually records something. You can create it from either the estimate or the sales order. In this case, possibly it might be more appropriate to take the sales order than to create the invoice. And the invoice is gonna increase accounts receivable, uh, meaning they owe us money. And the other side is gonna go to revenue. And if there's any kind of inventory that's gonna be deal dealt with here, it will also record the decrease in inventory and the related uh, cost of goods sold. And then on the customer side of things, when we have the invoice, the next thing is we have to receive payment on the invoice. So we send out the invoice, we track it, and then we're gonna get a payment on it. And the, usually we record then a receive payment. The receive payment could be an increase to cash, or you might put it into a clearing account called undeposited funds, which is a whole nother kind of issue. That's not really where our focus is right now, but th but it might go into the undeposited funds. And then the other side is gonna decrease accounts receivable. That's our point right now. It's decreasing accounts receivable when we receive the payment. Uh, and then of course we could record the deposit, which might take it out of undeposited funds and record it into the bank account if we used undeposited funds here, which we might do in the situation where we have multiple deposits that we're gonna be combining together that will hit the bank account in one lump sum, often the case if we're using like credit cards or we have cash sales, uh, for example. So that's gonna be the normal kind of process. Now also note that the sales order, you'll see that it goes up top here to a purchase order as well. Why does that happen? Why am I going up here to the purchase order? Well, yeah, I mean, if we got, say, a sales order, we made an estimate, we got a sales order, let's say that we make custom surfboards or something or custom guitars or something like that, well, then we're going to have to actually order the guitar and the custom color or whatever they want. So if we don't have the, the product on hand, then we're going to have to order it or we're going to have to make it if it was a job cost system, in which case we might make a purchase order which would then mean I'm gonna use the sales order to create the purchase order to request the inventory from my vendor, 
so I can get the inventory and then turn around and sell it with the invoice. So then I go to the purchase order and then we get the inventory. So the inventory adds another layer of complexity. Now that's gonna be the normal process. Now a couple wrinkles in the normal process. One is that if you use an estimate and you have a job cost system, one in which the job takes a fairly long amount of time. So it's not like you're doing, you know, you're not gonna, you're, you're, it's not like you're gonna do the job first and then invoice the client because the job is taking an extended period of time. Then you might not be using a normal revenue recognition principle, but a percentage of completion type of thing. Meaning you're gonna recognize revenue as you start doing the job. If you constructed an entire house or something like that, or had a large project within constructing a house, then you might be trying to, you might be appropriate then to recognize revenue, not when the job is done, but as you do the job. So now you have a revenue recognition issue. That's kind of a whole nother uh, type of accounting that we can, that is interesting field, good place to specialize in, but that's another kind of wrinkle in the situation. And then the wrinkle that we're really focused in on here is the idea, well, what if I, I get paid before I do the work? So, so now I'm going to say I'm still going to recognize the revenue possibly when the work is done, but I'm going to collect some revenue before I do the work because for multiple different reasons, right? One, I might be selling inventory. If I sell inventory and I have a custom inventory that I need to go to my vendor and purchase, you want a custom surfboard or guitar or whatever that has a certain color to it or something, I don't know. Then I have to order it from the vendor and I'm only gonna order that custom thing if you're locked into the sale. Well, how do I lock someone into the sale? We collect a down payment, we collect a deposit. So when we collect the deposit, we got paid before we did the work. That's where the issue comes about uh, in that situation. You have a similar situation with rental property. If you rent rental property, you might collect this, the last month's rent at the beginning as a way of locking people in, in the event that they kind of left or something like that. In which case, again, you got paid before you actually gave them the property, therefore you didn't earn it. And so you have this kind of this situation. The, you also might have the security deposit, which works basically the same kind of idea, meaning I'm gonna collect a security deposit, which I'm gonna give back to you if the property is in order when you leave. Again, you have this money that you haven't really earned uh, in that kind of situation. The other way that this often comes about is that you might be in an industry where you are in a subscription model. So it used to be newspapers, magazines, classic industry where you get paid before you do the work because they're on a subscription model and you have to give me the money before I start giving you the newspapers or magazines. Nowadays, computer uh, applications, of course, are running this way. So this is quite common if you're in that kind of industry, we have computer applications, someone's gonna give you money up front, and then you didn't actually do the work, you're doing the work over the next year, if it's a yearly subscription, for example. So that's these are all areas where we have this situation where instead of me invoicing and then getting paid, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get paid and then we're gonna invoice. So in the deposit situation, if I, I'm gonna get paid, the security deposit on the surfboard, the guitar, the rental property, and then I'm gonna invoice in the future for the money I already got, but that's reversed, right? So that messes up the normal flow, uh, which messes up my whole tracking process within kind of like the customer center up top. So, so that's gonna be uh, the issue, or you're gonna get paid in a subscription model, a year's worth of subscription, and then we're basically going to invoice or we're going to recognize the revenue on a monthly basis, let's say, right, for the for the 12 months out of the year after we did the work, after we actually gave someone access to the software or whatever that uh, that we are providing. So so then, of course, the question is, well, you, you might have a similar process where someone's going to take a job. We have an estimate let's say the custom surfboard situation, we're gonna say, okay, they want a custom surfboard. Here's how much it would cost. They commit to it. So we're gonna create the sales order. But then at the time that we create the sales order, we also are gonna receive a payment at that point in time. 
Now, the old way that we used to do this in QuickBooks is when we receive the payment, I would just record the receive of a payment and it would record it basically as an increase to cash or unearned revenue. And the other side would go into uh, uh, a negative accounts receivable, which isn't exactly right because from a debits and credit standpoint, if you, if you took accounting in school and you had the unearned revenue problem, it should go into unearned revenue, a liability account. So it shouldn't be a negative accounts receivable. It should be a positive liability. Easy from a debit and credit standpoint, but from a bookkeeping standpoint, it makes sense kind of to have a negative receivable because we're not just dealing with the debit and credit. We're also having to go up to my customer center here and I have to track this information by customer, you know? And, and so what I want to have is everything happening in one account, which is then supported by the customer center. So when you throw a liability account into the mix, it messes up my tracking in the subledger, in essence, from uh, th th that would be easier, more easily tracked if I had everything that was tied to one account. So from an internal accounting perspective, we have a negative asset versus a positive liability, which isn't right for reporting purposes, but actually kind of makes sense as, as easier from an internal accounting standpoint, a bookkeeping type of standpoint. And then we did adjusting entries kind of like at the end of the year so that it would be correct for reporting purposes. Uh, uh, and you can still do the internal kind of uh, bookkeeping. So that would be, that's how we kind of used to, that was the workaround or that's basically what we kind of did. Um, but now they, they have the system where we can say, create the sales order. And if we turn on the prepayment settings, then we can we can it'll create another account which is going to be the unearned revenue account or some kind of liability account we can name it whatever we want which is cool and then we can we can properly record this into a liability account instead of a negative accounts receivable account we'll still be able to track it in the customer center which is great but we'll also see that it's not like perfect because when I look at the reports, for example, the detailed reports by customer, then for, for one customer, it might not have the information for the liability accounts. It's gonna have the information related to the accounts receivable because now again, we have two accounts that are related to the customers that I kind of want to see together when I'm trying to analyze what's going on with any particular customer. So that's the, that's the new thing. It's really nice uh, and, and we'll test it out in a couple different ways. When we make the sales order, we'll then record the, the receive payment in essence in such a way that it'll be recorded to a liability account instead of a negative receivable account. We'll test out how it shows up over here uh, in the customer center. And then we'll, then we'll go through and, and make the invoice for it and follow through uh, the whole process and we'll run a few different scenarios. Now, again, some questions might come up in terms of, well, do I need to like move up from to like the enterprise version of this of accounting because I'm in, say, a subscription model or one where I have deposits and I need to track that? Maybe not. I don't you know, because you might you might be fine with the negative receivable method. Right. And so that might not be a problem if you do adjusting entries and, and you're aware of how the accounting process goes. Uh, and you might, even if you have the ability to do this process, in some ways, it's still kind of easier sometimes to have the negative receivable. So if you don't have that many deposits happening, you might not want to turn on the future, the feature where you're going to have that negative, that, that prepayment account, because you'd rather not add the complexity to the, to the software and just, and just do the normal kind of process. If you only have the deposits coming up from time to time. So those are kind of questions that that I, I think you can only really get to by running scenarios. So what we'll do is we'll run a scenario for the normal process and I'll actually kind of post it out in Excel as well. So you can see what's happening with the debits and credits as we go. And then we'll run the old version of a negative receivable so that you can see what happened before and why it was done that way and what are the pros and cons of it. And then we'll run some scenarios with the new method so we can compare and contrast the pros and the cons, the, the pros being properly recorded from a financial reporting perspective as, as we go, the cons being 
The bookkeeping is a little bit more complex from the reporting perspective. We add a clearing account, which is kind of weird because now we have to monitor the clearing account that's going to be going up and down and should it always be a zero balance. And um, and so, but it'll, it'll save us an adjusting entry basically at the end uh, of of the year. So that's what we'll get into.